The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of Green Acres and our guests. These general gardening tips and suggestions may work for you, as well as those from alternative sources. When using any garden products or tools, read and follow all label directions. And learn how to make your yard summer strong at BeWaterSmart.info. The Green Acres Garden Podcast is the podcast dedicated to helping gardeners hone their growing skills while we celebrate our love of plants. So whether you're new to growing or a seasoned gardener, you're sure to learn something new. Join the fun as we have conversations with world-class growers, passionate green thumbs, and professional garden experts from Green Acres Nursery and Supply. Listen every week. We'll answer questions you didn't know you had. If you want to grow a flower, first you got to plant a seed. Then give it some water, because that is what it needs. Uh, okay, now I'm ready to talk plants. Uh, Austin, please feel free to edit that oh, out. Oh, no, that was good. <laughs> Welcome on in, everybody, all you beautiful botanists and all you gorgeous gardeners. Welcome to the Green Acres Garden Podcast, Ooh. the home for all the green thumbs out there. Uh, I'm your host, Kevin Jordan, and I love talking plants. And this week, we have a great episode for you. I'm back in studio with Austin, my pumpkin spice latte loving buddy. Hello, buddy. What's up, Austin? Hey, I'm doing good. What, we've got a special guest. Super special guest, multi-time repeat guest, a gold level, gold tier guest. We've got Julie, the buttercup barbarian barber, uh, UC master gardener from Placer County. How's it going there, Julie? <laughs> I am just so happy to be here and see your guys' faces. I'm having the best time. Thank you. All right. Are you ready? You fired up for it? Absolutely. So today we're talking fall gardening, guys, and I'm excited to share a little uh, interview I did. I went over to the Green Acre store and uh, found one of our garden gurus. His name is Sam, and um, he has some advice for anyone who's looking to start a veggie garden this fall. Uh, so you guys want to check this out? Absolutely. All right. Let's, let's give this a listen. Hey, I'm here at the Green Acres in Citrus Heights, and I just found Sam. Sam, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. My name is Samuel Nelson. I work out on the patio at Green Acres, where we have all our pretty flowers and lovely veggie starts. I hear you have some recommendations for fall planting. What do you think? Should be people be growing in the fall? What Absolutely. should they be doing? Absolutely. Now's the best time to start getting stuff planted while the sun's still a little bit higher in the horizon and it doesn't get too uh, far into actual fall. Um, get some plants established and grow them before it gets too cold. Now's a great time, you know, it's still pretty warm, the soil's still pretty warm, so things are gonna germinate quickly and get established a lot faster. I personally like to grow a lot of leafy greens. Lettuces are some of my favorites. Um, you can get a lot of different varieties, including seeds that are already got mixed varieties in it. You only need one pack. They germinate quickly, they do really well in this cooler weather, and um, you know, are really easy for harvesting a salad at the last minute. Um, nice. <laughs> real simple, and uh, once again, one of my favorites. Uh, I like to grow a lot of kale and spinach as well, leafy greens do really great around this time of year and you can harvest them like the cells as you need. Um, dino kale, the Lacinato Tuscan kale is one of my favorites. It has a great flavor, is really easy to, uh, to handle, uh, grow and to cook actually. Um, and then another one of my favorites would be growing broccoli rob and or broccolini. They don't grow the big florets like the standard broccoli does, but you do get a good harvest from them as they grow a lot more small florets and can produce a continuous harvest for a much longer time. Do you have any recommendations for actually how we're sowing these seeds or how we're gonna get success in the garden with these seeds? Gotcha. So I like to direct sow a lot of this stuff at this time of year. It gets germinated and then established a little faster than having to give it some transplant shock and go through the process of starting it in something else. Um, once they are germinated, they start growing pretty quickly. One of the great things about the growing lettuces or kales or leafy greens is you can harvest them at any point. You want baby greens, cut them early. I like to over sow my garden so that I do have a lot. I can harvest some as little baby greens, leave other ones to keep growing as heads. So I go pretty heavy when I you know, sow them in there. I really like this term. I don't know if I've even heard it before. You said over-sow, <laughs> and I love that approach. It sounds like a really great 
uh, tactic that yeah. people could utilize. Can yeah. you maybe uh, uh, explain it in your own terms and kind of yeah. how would you recommend people over sow? So if you look at the back of the packages or wherever on the packages of the seeds, it'll explain how to space them out. I usually don't follow that. I just do a nice like continual line of seeds throughout the whole little uh, area I'm planting, trench essentially. And um, you know, just as they start to germinate, if they are crazy overcrowded, you can thin them out a little bit. But usually within a few weeks or so, got some baby lettuces, I'm ready to thin out and actually just start eating. Like at this point, the arugula in the mix that I planted is starting to overtake the other varieties. So I'm just gonna pick all that out and make arugula salad for dinner tonight or tomorrow. It's just a garden, they're just plants. You know, garden on your own terms. Don't spend all your time online looking for, you know, special techniques. Do what's comfortable for you. Have a good time, this is supposed to be a hobby. And the best part of this hobby is you get to eat what you produce. If you like to cook, gardening is a great you know, hobby to go along with that. As I said before, the winter garden is so much easier than the summer in a few ways that it really is um, you know, worth making the effort for. Cool, can't wait to share this with everyone. All right, great, well yeah, my pleasure and uh, anytime and it's real nice uh, talking to you guys. Cheers. Yeah, thanks man. Thank you. All right, we are back. I, I got to share it with you guys. I'm so happy that I got to do that and bring it here. Thank you to Sam for uh, sitting down with me for a second and uh, sharing all that. I thought it was packed full of great knowledge. What do you think? Well done, Austin. Oh, and well you. done, Sam. I like him already. I yeah. feel like we'd get along. And his his information and his tips were spot on. Everything he was saying, I'm just nodding my head along like, yep, yep, yep. I love all this. I love what he's saying. And it really, the takeaway is it is a great time of the year to grow. It doesn't have to be difficult. You can do it on your own terms. I love the over sowing. Actually, that's what Julie and I were just talking about, you know, over sowing before we started recording. It's like, hey, you can do your own thing. You know, the seed packets have a, have a lot of information and some of that spacing and things can be helpful, but sometimes you kind of got, it's okay to go rogue a little bit. And when it comes to certain <laughs> plants, you know, planting a little bit more than you need from seed can be helpful because okay. not all seeds are going to make it. And you can always thin them out. You can spread them out. Um, there's a lot of versatility in the garden. So I love what Sam had to share. It was spot on. Cool. Yeah. So I think we should maybe dive into um, what people uh, recommend growing. He suggested the leafy greens, uh, lettuce and the lacinato kale. Uh, Julie, what do you think? Are, th are those some good ones? Do you have any other ideas? What do you think we should be growing? So in the winter, for winter crops specifically, anything that's a leafy green is great. And this is also the ideal time to start putting in any root vegetables, anything that's going to grow the majority of what you're going to eat underneath the soil. Potatoes, parsnips, all those kinds of things, Carrots. right? Oh, yeah. Carrots. You can't Beets. go wrong. And have you ever looked at the seed section in the store? Colorful. How many kinds of carrots are there that's available? It's profound. And carrots and radishes are, they're just the fastest things going. So you're going to have results really quick. But any of the greens, any of the root vegetables, and what's fun about winter veggie is, and Sam talked about that, about it being easier. And why is it easier? It turns out the number of pests are way down in the fall mm. and the winter. Weeds are oh, way yeah. down in the fall and the winter. So you're not checking on them every 20 minutes like you are with these heavy intensity summer crops where everything else is also heavy intensity. <laughs> so winter is a lot easier. It's a lot less stressful and a lot of great results. Now, Julie, of course, we're, we're discussing for our climate zone, right. USDA 9B, yeah. um, which is based off how cold our coldest days get, our minimums. If we have listeners that are maybe growing up and they're living in the mountains or they're in the Bay Area or they're in Texas or another state or country, what is the best way for them to learn about what they should be planting right now at the, uh, for this time of year? Checking with their local master gardeners in their county. They are always using University of California information, and that information is going to tell you about frost dates and all these things that are key to whether or not you're going to start by seed, start by plant, direct sow, transplant, all these things. And each county can be profoundly different. So checking with your local uh, land grant, University of California Master Gardeners, University of Iowa Master Gardeners, check them out. Great information. Now, we're looking at the Green Acres vegetable planting calendar. One of my favorites. Yes. And so I'm looking for this right now. I'm looking at September, October, November, and even in December a little bit. There's quite a bit of seeds. Yeah. And just for uh, these next three months, October, November, and maybe even into September, I feel like there's as many, if not more, 
plants on that list that you can plant right now than you can even in the springtime, I feel like. there It is a heavy, heavy time for there's a lot of diversity of crops that we can grow. And like you guys said, a lot of your greens, a lot of your root vegetables. I w- I'm going to try my hand at some parsnips this year. Yep. One for me that I love growing, which I guess is a green and an herb, but mostly an herb, cilantro. Oh, gosh. So, um, everybody tries to weather. grow cilantro and dill in the summer. And what happens? They bolt. They bolt. They put out those huge seed heads. You've got all your cucumbers and tomatoes coming. Oh, yeah. No herbs. No flavor. Oh, so that wasn't my fault when that when that happened to me. Oh no, no. it was your fault. It's Absolutely. Just, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's just no. the weather. It's the wrong time of year. It's the wrong time of oh. year. And right. same thing with lettuce. Uh, when you're yep. trying to grow, oh, it's sunny. I'm going to grow some lettuce, and it starts getting a little bit hot there. And you know, in uh, June, July, you're like, no, they bolt, and the flavor right. kind of goes off. So cooler weather before that frost hits. I mean, lettuce is killer. I mean, yeah. you, you heard Sam bring it up. He's like, I love growing just. Baby greens and lettuce and the spinach and that last night of kale, the dinosaur food. It's just long, leafy straps that kind of come up arching out of a fountain, Austin, and they're all bumpy and lumpy. Oh, and I love have it. Have great texture. They I look, eat that stuff. They're good in soups. You can stir for. I mean, they're yep. they're killer. But uh, I mean, broccoli, your cauliflower, your cap, all your brassicas are wild. Your mustard greens, peas and whatnot, uh, fava oh, yeah. beans with a nice key ante, <laughs> delicious, <laughs> right? Hello, Curtis. It's good to see you again. He, he loves doing this that This is one. turning into the morning show, <laughs> yeah, boys. Yeah. All right, now. <laughs> Silence of the lambs. Uh, so, wait, you haven't done parsnips before? Not in my garden, but I've been eating them these last few okay. years. And I'm like, okay. wait, why have I not been, what am I doing with my life? Uh, they're so delicious. I want to do a root roast. Get beets, Ooh, yeah. get parsnips, get some carrots, uh, get some herbs from the garden, some thyme, some rosemary, a little um, wine. You, there, there we go. In there. Yeah. Yeah. And just tear it up. Um, there's, like you said, it's it's a hobby. You should have fun. But what's cool about this hobby is that you get to eat and cook and enjoy yep. and share the things that you grow. And so um, I'm loving it. So look up. We'll, we'll attach. Can we attach the calendar? Yeah, no problem. So this is called the vegetable planting calendar that Green Acres puts out. And I'll go ahead and link to that in the episode description. So look for that there. And there's a bunch of, um, you know, columns of months like Kevin mentioned, a bunch of crops that you can grow. And then it tells you if you should, uh, you know, directly plant it or... You're reading um, my mind, Austin. Plant yep. starters. And, and Sam was just talking about direct... Sowing, and that's yeah. what you guys recommend too, right? Yes and no. It depends on the time of okay. year. So you're counting on fall, that soil being warm, and that soil is only going to be warm for so long. So you need to get your seeds in so that they develop a root zone, and then you're ready to start having what you want to eat in the winter. But let's suppose it's getting a little bit later in the season. You don't have as much time to grow that root zone and get that big plant. So you're going to start looking at P for plant on the Green Acres Vegetable Planting Mm -hmm. Calendar. It'll say S for seed, P for plant. And you'll see a month in there where it's S slash P. In other words, let's find out what's happening out there. Maybe it got cold early this year. Maybe it didn't. Okay. Broccoli would be a great example of that. Um, It takes a little while to get them to get going. If you waited a little too long, by the time you hit October, you, you need a transplant. Right, a little seedling, and that's what or you're mentioning. Or it's because you're right. saying the soil has gotten too cold. The soil has gotten too cold, so you're not going to get that huge fat root zone, and you're not going to get that big green plant on which the Brussels sprouts and broccoli are going to show up. For sure. So we have direct sowing. Uh, I love, for me, carrots. I've transplanted them before with a little bit of success. I was surprised. But ultimately, those ones do so much better, direct sowing. Anything uh, with a tap root yeah. seems to have a problem with transplanting. Kind of makes sense. So uh, California poppies, you know, things like that. You need to have them direct sow. So what does direct sow mean? You're going to look on your seed packet if you're starting with seeds, and it's going to talk about planting depth. And it's going to say something insane, like a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch. (laughs) Which is nothing. So what you do is you just take your finger, make a little row, a little depression Uh in your soil, drop your seeds in. And these seeds are tiny, by the way. Right. So you're going to have 57,000 in one spot, five in another, none in another. It's okay. It's all going to work out. You're going to do the best you can. And then you're almost literally going to just... Blow some soil over the top of them. You want very little. It's a tiny little blanket. So direct sow involves a little bit of a depression, putting down the seeds, and then a little bit of a blanket of soil on top. And that's it. No tamping it down. 
You're just making it light and fluffy, and then you just close your eyes, turn around, walk to the house, ignore them. Okay. Now, <laughs> let me try to break down your advice there. I think what you're suggesting is is that it's it's loose enough that the baby roots have... They're able to push into the soil. Exactly. And any leaves that are growing are able to push through whatever was on top. Beautifully And put. able to get to the sun. Right. But also, we want a loose cover so it doesn't get blown away by the wind or picked up by a bird or something like that. Right? In fact, that's what I always say. You're putting down enough soil on top of those seeds to just hide it from the birds. Okay, cool. That's really what we want. And it serves a lot of other purposes, but that's the thing that we can always remember. Just hide it from the birds. Hide it from the birds. <laughs> and please, when you water these in, don't blast them with the hose with the force of a thousand oh, rivers. You gentle. know, just be gentle. Light rains, but thorough. Keep them moist. If you're blasting it out and you're just using your thumb, you might get in trouble. So make sure it's on that shower setting, kind of low or, you know, or a nice rain head. Um, so that, you don't want to disturb the seeds. Yeah. Now, what is damping off? Can you explain that? So when we talk about watering those little seeds, and you were talking about being very, very gentle because you don't want to dislodge the seed, or once it begins to germinate, you don't want to dislodge that little baby plant. And, damp, and that means that you're actually keeping the soil fairly moist to a certain depth continually. And then there becomes this time where the seed actually starts to germinate and maybe poke through the sun, uh, the soil a little bit. The risk of something called damping off can start to happen because you're keeping it wet all the time. Maybe if you're starting inside, the humidity got a little out of control, something happened. And you're going to see the plant just get a little bit thin, a little bit listless in color, and then next minute he just flops over. Yeah. Mm. That's why there's 500 seeds in a packet. You might only want five Brussels sprout plants, but there are risks, um, problems, things that might break your heart a little bit. But if you could just go ahead and step back and realize there's 50 seeds in there. Why is that? Because things happen. They're not all going to perfectly germinate. They aren't. They just aren't. And you're not allowed to take that personally. Nope. <laughs> nope. 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 Not so, your fault. Not your fault. It's not your fault. Because think, remember, you're recreating the exact circumstances that a plant needs, that a seed needs. There are so many things on your end to know, and there are so many more things that we don't understand that are going on. What is that soil temperature? What is the sun? Where is the angle? These things are way above my pay grade. <laughs> I'm really just hoping for the best. Yeah, for sure. Have you have you noticed how like um Different seeds, different sizes, different shapes and styles, different styles of uh, the seed coat, the outer covering, right? right? If you've right. ever had, um, you know, burrs on your socks when you went hiking, they yeah. uh, stuck to you. Those are seeds. That's, that's the seed coat, the adaptation. Yep. Uh, you brought up, we talked about beets a little bit ago. Right. Um, they look totally different than a carrot seed, which is small and angular and flat. The yeah. beets are large and lumpy and bumpy and have like a hard like armor, you treat them differently. And so what, right. I, what I like to do with my beets is I soak them overnight in water before I plant. Have you ever done anything like that? Yeah, mm. so uh, you can soak them in water. Another way is uh, sometimes on paper towels that are really moist, and you can put the seeds on top of that, and you're keeping that moist. There are all kinds. And then what is that term, scarification? Ooh, you beat me to it, yeah. All right, so there are some seed coats that are just so... Um, They're tough. tough. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It's like they never <laughs> want to grow. So you actually get to scarify them, which is a process of rubbing that outer coat so that when it gets moist, it does start to break up and the little seedling is able to emerge. So there are all kinds of tricks to the trade. So even though we have all this general information for you from the vegetable planting calendar, you are looking at that seed packet. Oh, yeah. Uh, talk about planting depth, planting spacing. Know that it's possible you need to look individually into the plant that you're putting down and from the ground up. So let's find out how that seed is going to happen. Yeah, seed packets are awesome. They offer, typically, I've noticed they offer a lot of information. And I'm noticing more and more lately where some, the inside and the outside, actually is covered with growing information, history, and relevant facts. How important is it for someone to kind of um, maybe keep that catalog? It. I know oh, in the past I yes. made the mistakes of just planting my seeds and then just tossing them out. I'm like, whatever. But <laughs> then I'm kicking oh. myself like, wait, what did we plant? or how did Right. It? So that seed packet is going to talk specifically about how far apart to plant each seed. It's also going to give you key information on when it germinates. So when five days have gone by and you go out there and go, where are they? You can refer back to the seed pack and it says, oh, 12 days, no yeah. panicking. 
when we look at that seed packet and we plant, we think that our job is done and we get rid of the packet. But you're going to need that packet for the next couple of weeks to see when it's going to germinate, when it's going to mature. So if you feel like that seed packet, if you can't open it really nicely or the children helped you open it or the dog helped you open it, <laughs> take a picture of that packet before you open it. And you can have that information in your phone forever. I yeah. like that idea. You've been saying, Kevin, to start a garden journal. Yes. And uh, Julie, I don't know if you know this, but I got a community garden plot. And Gosh, I'm you. growing in the ground, and now I'm logging my time that I work on it and what I'm doing to the soil and what I'm planting. Now I'm starting to plant things, and I'm writing it down and keeping track of it, and I yeah. love it. But oh, keeping a record in your phone is keeping, smart, too. And what you're doing, actually, is really important, Austin. If you're telling me that where you planted and what you planted— this is the key thing that you're going to have for the rest of your life to making sure that your plants do not suffer from pests and diseases. Pests and diseases are counting on you being consistent. So if you took a record that you planted your carrots right here mm -hmm. and you planted your tomatoes right there, you know that next year you're going to swap positions. Oh, okay. Crop rotation is not just for the big operations. It's for you. Okay, I, I wasn't thinking about that. So using that record cool. will tell you, oh, I'm going to move my broccoli over there yeah. next time. I'm going to put my spinach over there next time. And I'm talking about a regular box. Maybe you've yeah. got 10 by 4. It's 30 by 10. Huge. <laughs> you went but for it. I know. I've got a little <laughs> diagram. I'm drawing it out and stuff, too. Good. I'm keeping track of all that. Just put a yeah. date on it, and yep. then you're going to know, yep. okay, next year I'm going to change it up a little bit. And you're going to find that the incidence of diseases and pests just plummets. Oh, radical. And like you brought up, the fun part about fall gardening, just less less pests, oh. less weed pressure, less insect pressure. Is this fall into IPM? Yes. It does? It does. So integrated pest management, right? Yeah. Which says... I've learned might... about this from you. Oh, you know how to get Julie all fired <laughs> I up. I know. Look, she sat up straight and everything. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Just got to say those three letters. What's great about integrated pest management out of the university is all these people have done all these tests, all these experiments, and all this research. Which means I don't have to be an entomologist. I don't have to be a botanist. I just have to check what the research said right. from my area. And when you use integrated pest management and you have an issue, you get to look at IPM and say, why did I have that issue? Why did I have white flies all the time? Why did I have aphids all the time? Why didn't I get nice flowers? And you type in UC for University of California, IPM, roses, aphids, broccoli, white fly, and it's going to bring you right to it. And you can go ahead and say, oh, you know what? I forgot. I really wanted to have organic fertilizer this year and not a synthetic. If I'm using a synthetic, it's a lot of nitrogen. I'm getting a lot of growth and I'm not getting any fruits or flowers. And correct me if I'm wrong, but with IPM too, is as you start to solve or correct the issue, it's always um, the least kind of like the, the least yeah. intrusive or the least intense uh, form first. Right. You kind of work your way down the list for, you know, physical removal, you know, the, using the water and organic sprays and things of that nature. Checking on your irrigation, checking on the fertilization, checking on your compost, whatever it is, before you reach for a bottle, let's make sure that we've got the right growing conditions out there. Nice. Certainly. Um, I was also wanting to get your guys' opinion on something Sam said in that little interview. He was talking about over sowing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started talking about sowing a bit. We we're looking at, you know, talking about what the seed packet says to do. But can we can we go crazy? Can yes. we over sow? Yes, you sure can. What a great question. So if you put down so many seeds that you can't see the dirt anymore, you <laughs> went too far. Oh, geez. Yeah, and just don't dump them all into one singular spot. Okay. No, volcanoes. I like how he mentioned how he does it in a trench and yeah. kind of just runs it down nice and heavy. That's fantastic. But I've had a students where I had a whole line of plants. I'm like, where 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 are they? There's just one. Like Pile. two square inches yeah. of a thousand <laughs> seeds. Yeah. So somewhere in between that maybe might be good. I, I always think of it, uh, I want to see a hailstorm. I don't want to see a snowstorm. Oh, not a whiteout. Right. But just a little bit. Right. I want to see some, okay. I got to see some dirt in the middle. But then Otherwise, does that require um, more, like as they start to grow, like, do you need to thin it out? Sure. And competition, that, man. Yeah. You created over competition. But it's okay though. 
Yes and no. Okay. Uh, in a way, it means your soil was great, your care was great, the stars were aligned was great, everything worked out well. But you can't have that heavy competition. The plants will be stunted and you won't get as much fruit or flowers or veggies. So you got to start doing a process called thinning. And I'm going to have Kevin talk about when you thin, but I just want to talk about how you thin. Okay. So it's always tempting to pull out those. Uh, so if you put down um, green onions or something, and those seeds are notoriously tiny, so you can get so many in a spot. Do not pull. Okay, because what's why? What's underneath the soil is all those root zones from all those little seedlings have intermeshed. Okay. So if you pull, you're going to pull out good root zones. Ones you want to leave behind or getting disturbed, yeah. Instead, you are going to cut mm. and just leave that little plant top right there in the soil. Not a problem. But how you choose when to thin can really be important. Yeah, for us, it really depends on the crop. Like if we're doing um, like a mixture, like a bed of leaf lettuces, we can let them kind of snuggle in with each other and get a little closer but compared to like a cabbage or broccoli oh. or something where the plant really tends to get, because like, all of them are going to start as this tiny little seed, but some of those plants at maturity, they're going to get quite large. So they, they will need some adequate space. Now you can get them in a little tighter, but um, it's going to be plant specific for me. Honestly, once they've popped up and we've had a few s- sets of there's those first true leaves and I kind of start to see, okay, how they're all looking, then I kind of get in there and start start snipping things out and thinning. Very important with things like you brought up carrots. Mm-hmm. Oh, and talk about germination rate or oh, p- time through the roof. So germ- uh, with germination time with carrots, you got to be patient. So in the time that you plant, if you planted a carrot seed and a radish seed at the same day, you would probably be harvesting your radish before you see the sprout of the carrot. Oh man! Or around the same time, give <laughs> yeah. or take. Yeah. Just because carrots are notoriously, they take longer. And that's fine. So just know that. But I noticed that the seeds are really small. We, we over-sow those as well, but we have to go back and thin them out because if we leave them, like you, like you mentioned, Julie, they all start competing, and then you're going to get their roots intertwangling, and you'll see pictures online. What happened to my carrots? Uh, and there's a lot of things that could happen. Uh, sometimes it's they're hitting rocks in the soil, or they're, they're, their soil is just not deep and rich enough or loose enough. But oftentimes you'll see these weird-looking carrots, and it's because there's so many so close to each other, their roots are are fighting each other, they're battling for space and resources. So thin them out, what, like once every inch or two, depending. Um, and you can, eat, we'll even do um, periods of thinning. We'll go That's through, right. thin a little bit, let them yes. grow a little bit bigger and go, oh, okay. And then as they get larger, then we might do another series of thinning, um, especially for things like carrots and whatnot. Because what he's looking for is what are the healthy ones and he's creating some space for them all to be really successful. But if we're talking about... Um, cabbage, which is going to get two feet across, Big. you can't leave three in that two foot section. So he goes back mm. again a few weeks later and he's like, okay, I need this much space. I want the plants to cuddle, to touch, but I don't want them to fight it out. So he'll go back again after a few weeks and look at who's strongest, who, you know, and maybe two or three seeds sprouted in one spot. He's like, that's not going to happen. So he's going to look <laughs> at the strongest one and remove two. He might have removed even more space because he brought me a cabbage one time. I, I was just going to say. It was as big as a, it was bigger than a basketball. Oh, I love growing cabbage. That thing was huge. <laughs> so satisfying. People go, whoa, you're so good. And you're just like, no, I just got I decent soil and the cabbage did all. all the work. <laughs> yeah. But one good thing, I'm frugal. I don't know about you guys. I mean, so I, as I'm guilty as charged, yeah. but uh, I love to can be frugal with my plants. Sometimes I'll let those, some of those larger seedlings, if they get large enough and I thin them, I'll just scoop them up, put them in a little container and then replace a plant maybe uh, somewhere else that didn't make it. Or I'll give them away to a friend, let them transplant it. Because those ones are transplantable, um, which is kind of fun. So uh, sometimes you will overseed and it's not all lost. You can kind of go back and recuperate some of those potentially and and, uh, utilize them. It's fun. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, thank you guys. I'm getting all pumped for this this coming season, and I just hope everyone else is too. So check out a vegetable planting calendar. Find out what you want to grow and um, go for it. Over so put those seeds in the ground and let's get this going. Um, do you guys have any final advice for uh, listeners looking to grow veggies this season? So I'm always about forgiveness. All right. There's a reason there's more than 50 seeds in a packet because not all of them are going to take and you might have to redo it again. And 
check the date of your seed packet. If you've had some seed packets in your home for a couple of years, know that they only slowly start to become less and less viable. Mm -hmm. So if it's one year old, you're going to get fewer, but it's not a lost cause. Two years old, you're starting to get a little bit more lost. And at some point, you're just looking at putting them in the compost. So get fresh seeds when you can. Certainly. And always plant more than you think you might need. Uh, I love growing from seed. We talked about it. It offers so much variation in your there, garden. Yes. I love growing plants that I know I'm going to eat and enjoy. So I guaranteed yep. like a little bit, you know, of, of payback, but I always would recommend, um, and you kind of touched on this, Julie's find some weird stuff, find yep. some things that you're curious about, grow something new and interesting. Always put aside a little corner of your garden or, uh, you know, a yeah. row or something, some space for something new, something weird. And that's kind of cool for you, Austin. All of it's going to be new. I know. I can't wait. Oh, All man, that's awesome. I'm having a blast I'm so fired far. up for you, man. That's yeah. fun. I can't wait to see the it's pictures. This is I'll great. I'll be sharing. And then I, I can't wait to have stuff to share on the Facebook group, too. Oh, so. Fabulous. Oh, if you guys want to follow along my little journey here, I'll be posting there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. I'll be looking forward to, to eating. What comes out of there, oh, man? It's I know gonna, it tastes so good. I'm telling no you. No shame. Look the at you. Satisfaction. He's just yeah. gonna pull up his truck. The amount of stuff <laughs> he's been hooking me up with all this time. He's due. He's due. There for we some go. Crops. All right. Excellent. Hey, thanks for coming into the studio with us. Thank you so Hanging much. Hanging out Huge and um, yeah. And Kevin, go ahead and take us out. Well, another great week out in the garden here, talking with friends. Uh, thank you to all of our listeners for showing up every week. We love having you here and appreciate it, Sam. Man, we yes. have to make some time for Sam. He yeah. sounds like a good guy. Julie, the Buttercup Barbarian. Julie comes from Our Water, Our World. Thank Check you. them out. They do awesome work. They're really all about getting people as much knowledge and information and skill sets on how to grow well with using less, you know, less water, less chemicals, and how to still be productive and successful in the garden. So we love it. Check them out. Julie, thank, thank you. you again so much. We love you. The best. Until next week, garden friends, happy gardening to you all. And please never, never stop, stop growing. growing.